Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I hope uh, I'm coming through loud and clear. You know, as far as these things go, you have to uh, always leave some room for a little lag time or, or any technical issues. But I'm excited, excited to be here today. Um, so welcome to another episode of Open Air Artist uh, Conversations and Virtual Visits uh, hosted and presented by the Harvey B. Gantt Center. My name is Dexter Wimberly. I'm a consulting curator for the Gantt Center, and I'm really um, enthusiastic about today's conversation. We're joined by an artist whose career I follow very closely for the past decade, and I am honored that he's taking some time to talk to us today about his work. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Yashua Klaus. Um, in his multimedia practice, Yashua explores themes and identity of identity, memory, and an African-American's relationship to American labor. His large-scale works are created from the intricate formation of woodblock prints representing ideas of blackness through multi-dimensional fragmented portraits. Unlike traditional collage arranged from ready-made source material, Klaus creates all his collage material through woodblock printing and monotypes. His work reimagines the black body as an alchemical being surviving and existing within intertwined networks of history, myth, and lived reality. Yashua was born in Chicago in 1977. He received a BFA from Northern Illinois University in DeKalb and an MFA from Hunter College, City University of New York, both in fine art. His current exhibition, Our Labor, is on view at Sigma Jenkins Gallery in New York City. Without further ado, Yashua, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dexter. It's an honor to be in conversation with you. I'm glad that you took a moment to highlight that we have been having these conversations for over 10 years. So it's always great to see uh, a friend and a person that has been behind the work and reading the work and uh, you know helping me think through these ideas for so long. So thank you. Yeah. You know, I'm one of the great joys that I have of being a curator is, you know, obviously putting exhibitions together is one thing, but it's relationships. Um, uh, building relationships and also seeing people grow, um, both in terms of their career and also in terms of their ideas about the work that they're making. So, you know, as far as these things go, I always know that there's a certain audience that's coming here knowing a bit about you. Um, and then there's another portion of the audience that's coming with pure curiosity without knowing much of anything. So let's honor the people that don't know much <laughs> about your work uh, and your career. And so with that said, let's go back in time a little bit. And I, I read your bio, but maybe you could just take two to describe the work that you make um, in your own words, like how, how, how you would describe um, your practice, your creative it doesn't have to be lengthy, but I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, of course, excellent. And and in in that that same um, in that same attitude, yeah, welcome to all. For for those that are brand new to my work, um, my work today is an evolution of a process that I discovered. I guess at this point, it's uh, fifteen years ago. And it's based in woodblock printing. Uh, you can see a piece behind me on the wall that uh, looks uh, like it's a amalgamation. It's a, a um, it's definitely a collage of woodblock prints. So I'm creating my own textures, colors, um, and swatches by carving into wood, inking up the block of wood, printing by hand and then cutting, reassembling those pieces to build imagery. And that imagery is often about identity. Um, earlier works, as you recall, Dexter, those were about um, these sort of identities that I was building from my community that was friends of mine, that was also memories. I was also kind of uh, thinking about um, mythologies, uh, but it was all sort of about the construct of blackness um, that I was kind of uh, sorting through, right? And uh, within that construct, of course, there's uh, a strength and a fragility because I'm announcing these identities to be uh, statuesque, robust, made of concrete, or like the one behind me, made of wood, 
uh, and, and of course, that's about form. It's about sculptural form, which is a realized uh, representation, right? So with that, there's a lot of um, concern for a form and a representation that's sturdy, that's stable, that, that lasts through time. And however, uh, because of the materiality of how they're built, I'm using paper, these are ultimately identities that in some ways undermine that idea of strength because they're fragile and they're pieced together through fragments. Thank you for sharing that. So if I'm not mistaken, you're in your studio at this moment in New York City in the Bronx. Um, right. But you're not but you're not from the Bronx. So I'd love to um, kind of talk about origins here. I and mean, the last couple of years have been quite transformative for you. And um, you know, I think you could use so many superlatives, you know, eye opening, groundbreaking, all these things that have happened um, because of new discoveries that you've made about your life and your lineage and your genealogy. And I know these are things that you've talked about a lot in the past couple of years, but please indulge us <laughs> and, and share, share a little bit about um, the, the uh, amazing moment or events that happened in the past couple of years as you reconnected with family. Yeah, great. So this is this is speaking about now the evolution of the work, right? So with the premise that I've just given this idea of identity, and now we understand some of the process and materiality. Um, just before COVID, I had a big conceptual shift in the work, and that about through reconnecting with my father's side of the family. So um, I grew up raised by my mother, single parent mom, on the south side of Chicago mom who was white, father who was black, African-American, uh, had very little contact with him growing up. One time when I was seven years old, he took me on a road trip to Michigan to meet the rest of family there. So I met all these aunts, uncles, and cousins one time in my life when I was seven years old. And of course, as a kid, we kind of turned these uh, memories into fantasies. Sometimes we're not sure exactly how big it was in reality, right? But it seemed huge to me. And it certainly made an impression. Um, having said that, I went, up, I went on about my life, of course. And only uh, four years ago, just before COVID, I did a DNA test. And I did it not to reconnect with my father's side of the family. I did it to get, like a lot of people, just wanted a breakdown of the, the countries that I could connect my DNA to. So I knew that my mother was Polish and German, so I would get uh, East European ancestry there. But on my, through my father, uh, I wasn't sure which countries in Africa I was connecting to. So I got my breakdown, Congo, uh, a lot of West African countries as well, Central and West Africa, um, like many of us, descendants of those who came through the slave trade. And I was fine with that. A year later, a cousin reached out to me through Facebook and said, hey, we did the same DNA test on our side. I think we might be related. That turned into a phone call, FaceTime, quick catching up, making up. And uh, I was making trips to Detroit uh, within months. So uh, this has been uh, you know, a huge evolution in uh, my life, which has led to a huge evolution in the work. So. All that to say, while the work started about sort of more general ideas about identity, now I'm dealing with my identity within a larger family. And also now portraits of individual family members. And, you know, so the identity becomes a little bit more about the distance that we've had between us. And also it acts as a way for me to bridge that distance to get closer to them. And when you and when you started making these trips to Detroit, were those your first sort of forays into that city, connecting with that city? Uh, had you had a longer history with Detroit prior to uh, these family members reaching out? No, I hadn't had much much uh, involvement with Detroit. You know, like I mentioned, I, I had been there once when I was seven years old um, when my father took me there. Uh, but now I go every opportunity I can. Uh, my dad was one of fifteen children and most of them had children. So it's a huge family. There's a lot of birthdays. There's a big holidays. My family rents out the town hall for Thanksgiving, feeds 200 people. They invite other families in. 
And, and, and having said that, there's also funerals that happen when you have a large family, right? So there's, there's a lot to celebrate. There's times for mourning and, and just support. Um, but uh, my family is really uh, as, as generous as they come. I have not met people that are this loving and caring and uh, and giving and i'm surprised at how much they're welcoming me back into the family because they already have so much family overflowing it doesn't seem like they need yet and yet more uh connection with family but uh you know we look at each other sometimes we just wonder how come it feels like we have been doing this our entire lives this doesn't feel like we've missed a beat ever so uh i'm very fortunate i'm very lucky um, I'm also fortunate that as an artist, I found my purpose and my art is a way for me to uh, try to translate and understand and digest complicated information. So again, being a part of such a, a large family, for me, it took uh, a process like the, the work that I make in order to kind of understand my familiar relationships and wrap my head around what all of this was meaning to me. Wow, thank you for sharing that. In many ways, you know, this is a tale of, you could say um, two cities, but I, I like to say it's a tale of three cities, right? Um, because you're, you're based in New York City now. But let's, but let's talk a little bit about Chicago because um, obviously that's a massively influential city on you as a person. Um, and I'd love to see, uh, you know, or hear rather, uh, a bit about how Chicago uh, has influenced you as an artist and what your connections to Chicago are today. Like what's your, what's your connection to the city? Yeah, of course. So Chicago was really a large part of the location of my earlier works. So as I mentioned, this idea of identity as a composite, right? So, uh, as we know, Chicago is one of the most racially segregated cities in the States. I think growing up uh, as a biracial black person, I was always hypersensitive of that, realizing that the city was interested in separating white and black, right? And what I, what I was thinking about in earlier works was how the policies of that city, redlining, um, that is creating zones where only uh, white people can buy property and homes. Black people had to live on the other side of red lines. The geographic and, uh, and urban planning that goes into building that city and how that affects one's psychology and, and their own uh, use of how we comport our bodies through that city, through those lines that are there to define us. So earlier works often dealt with these identity head forms that were confronting a grid structure. Chicago is said to have been built on a grid that is number streets intersecting name streets, right? So uh, that grid structure that those head forms were confronting was in some ways meant to confine and define their identities. And there's so many ways that we deal with that, right? Where we deal with uh, injustice. We can triumphantly kind of break through at points at some points, we just can peek around it enough for some relief. Sometimes we lean on it for support. So all of those kind of uh, survival tactics were sort of baked into the imagery that I was doing in older works. So newer works, uh, as, we're as we move from a sort of a Chicago location to Detroit, uh, you'll see less reference to the grid in an obvious way, and you'll see more of a reference to Detroit architecture which, uh, as we know, is situated in the Art Deco movement that came out of France, of course, adopted by many Midwestern cities, but Detroit in particular during the boom of the auto industry. So some of the, the design that you'll see in the background of new works, we start to look at imagery, you'll see this Art Deco architecture, which is kind of ghostly haunting in the background, right? It's looming as if it's some sort of memory of a past identity, because I don't think that we can separate our bodies from the locations that we inhabit. Thank you, thank you. There's so much, so much to unpack there. So let me just try to get my thoughts in order here as I wanna ask you a series of questions. So one is um, a question about space and the body. 
I think back to many of the earlier works um, that I um, saw of yours in the beginning of our relationship. And there were, um, there were a lot of sort of metaphorical and lyrical allusions to the body, um, sort of um, figures or p parts of figures floating in space, almost freeing themselves from the constraints of, um, of the grid. And now that you say what you just said, I kind of understand now, I understand now what I was seeing then. Sort of like a sort of like a movement and escape from the grid. You know, I'm very fascinated about how architecture and city planning um, has an impact on our psychology. And um, and this this is a perpetual thing. I mean, it's sort of like it's very easy for people to assume that this is sort of like the 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 remnants or the hangover of segregation or the hangover of Jim Crow. But it actually is still happening today. Uh, and it's happening in places that are not racially mixed, um, because this is also a class issue, not just the race issue. Without going off on too much of a tangent, there are plenty of buildings in major cities around the world that are, quote unquote, luxury buildings that have two entrances. Uh, and it's the entrance yeah. for the people of, yeah. above, say, floor 10 that own their units. And there's an entrance for the people, say, below floor 10 who rent their units and the tween shall never meet. <laughs> so this idea of, of, of controlling people through architecture is something that I think is just very prevalent. And so I'm, I'm glad that we spent some time thinking through that. So you mentioned the auto industry. And um, and and for those who don't know, uh, and assume almost everyone knows, um, you know about Detroit's history in relation to the auto industry, and I think it's amazing how you connected that to your exhibition at the Welland, and how you also tie that to the rediscovery of your family. And so, if I didn't have you here, I would try to explain that. But since I have you here. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to spend a moment to talk about the show at the Welland Museum and how you connected the dots on Detroit labor, the auto industry, and reconnecting with your family, because I think that's absolutely fantastic. Great. So the, uh, the connection with uh, invisible labor in America by Black folks is a connection that is both political and personal, right? So I am tracing my family history through Detroit, but my family, like many black folks, migrated from the South. My family's from Memphis and came to Detroit in the late 60s for jobs in the auto industry. So that was, at, that was sort of near the end of that wave of the boom, the second wave of the great migration with black folks moving from the South to the North and specifically in the Midwest for for auto industry, Chicago for steel mills and cattle. And my family, many of them uh, still work in an auto plant today or in, uh, there's a lot of industry of course in Detroit that is set up around uh, the automobile, uh, whether that's mechanics or, or you know parts, uh, but there's still a, a whole economy. It is not the thriving economy that it was uh, when, right. when black folks made that first migration and really helped build this structure for the American economy at the time. The, auto, the automobile was king and cities like Detroit thrived because of all of that, uh, the labor that black folks contributed. So our labor as a show is a reclamation of, of that. It is a reclamation of the history of that labor. And it's also about uh, a reclamation of um, you know, again, this is like my family bond and, and figuring out my space in the family and all the labor of love that I see my family doing in order to hold a family like that together. And that's what I'm learning from them. Um, and of course, as I mentioned from the outset of this conversation, Dexter, we talked a little bit about process and materiality. Um, so then that becomes the labor that is also implicated uh, in that in that title, Our Labor. It's my physical labor as a creative as well. So I'm bridging different parts of the labor. Um, I'm sure that once we get into the slides, we can talk more about that because there is that Diego Rivera piece, the uh, Detroit Industry Mural, which is at the Detroit Institute of Art, which he painted in 1933. Me seeing that piece in person, in person the second time I visited my family in Detroit, made a huge impact on me 
and gave me the seed for which I would grow the rest of this body of work. And I want to cue the cue the slideshow now because I think now would be a great time to have some images to support some of the things we're talking about. So while that slideshow is loading, um, I do have another question for you. Um, so you had a, you had an exhibition um, in recently in Luxembourg, and I had the honor of writing an essay um, for the catalog for that exhibition, and the exhibition was titled "We Hold the Wildflowers." So we've spent a lot of time talking about man-made structures. But let's talk about mm. nature, because I found that title mm. to be quite, um, you know, wonderful and lyrical. We hold the wildflowers. So while the slideshow is loading, maybe you can talk a little bit about what connected you to this concept of wildflowers. Because to be frank, flowers are kind of the last thing I think about when I think about cities like Chicago and Detroit. Beautiful, great point. So what I noticed when I started to visit my family in Detroit. And it's not it's, it's not hard to see. There's so much abandoned property. There are ab abandoned residential properties. There were once thriving commercial districts and, of course, industrial factories that have been abandoned, are defunct, collapsing. And what you see is there's all this weeds and wildflowers reclaiming them. Let's not forget Michigan is prairie land, right? It's right there on Lake Michigan. So we do have all of this nature that is asserting itself um, quite naturally without man's permission. And in some ways, I look at that as a sort of natural um, cycle of capitalism that where man asserts uh, ourselves onto a space in order to create uh, industry, um, you know, use the resources, sell the resources, that then becomes um, whether you know it's overmined or in, in the case of uh, Detroit, the American greed kicks in and those jobs get shipped overseas. Then the factories collapse and then the earth is there to reclaim space once again. So um, I looked at those wildflowers that I see popping up in Detroit and in Michigan uh, as really the strength that I see in a matriarchal family uh, like my own. So uh, the, the women in my family, uh, my Aunt Ari and Aunt Fatty, they're the ones who are really holding, they're the glue to the family that's really holding a lot of what's happening together there. So uh, in some ways, those, those flowers are also about paying homage to that, that matriarchal power. And so while we're waiting for the slideshow to begin, I'll, I'll throw another question your way. Well, there you go, as, as luck would have it. <laughs> Here we go. So, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be able to, you know, I, I, I would just say this to everyone that's joining us today. Um, so I'm just gonna take 60 seconds to say, say something that has nothing to do with you, Yeshua, but just has something broader to do with this experience. You know, I think the past couple of years, we have sort of had this strange opportunity to connect with artists all over the world in these digital formats so to you know talk to artists and actually look at the work and i think in in some regards because it's so frequent we can kind of take this for granted but i think that this is one of the more um wonderful um aspects of technology and the time that we're living in that you can literally talk to any artist who has a wi-fi or sorry internet connection you talk to any artist anywhere on the planet and get to hear directly from them and see their work from the comfort of your living room. <laughs> it's like, a, you know, there are days that I still, I marvel at how wonderful this opportunity is. So so let, let's go backwards um, to the slide because it just progressed. I wanna actually um, get back to that first image if we can. We have an opportunity now to sure. talk a little bit about process and how you're building these images because there are elements here that are not so easily visible um, on the screen so maybe you can kind of take us through what we're seeing here. What we think we know what we're seeing, but tell us what we're actually seeing. All right, so uh, at the very top of this image, you'll see some dots. Those are grommets that are, that are going through um, unstretched canvas. So this is a drapery of unstretched canvas, probably eight feet by eight feet or a little larger. Um, there are some elements popping off the surface and relief. Those are pieces of wood that are covered by rice paper. Of course, that's a tribute to the uh, Japanese tradition of woodblock printing. 
uh, with uh, Hokusai Hiroshi J contributing to, to that history. Um, and there is Art Deco, again, very ghostly in the background. You're seeing a lot of that geometry, probably that patterning in the background is Art Deco architecture. And of course, on the face of the figure, uh, you see it echoed again, as if it's some sort of scarification. Uh, again, finding ways to indicate that we cannot separate the body from location, from the spaces that we inhabit. This is a portrait uh, of my cousin, Yana. Yana's a second cousin who threw me a lot of shade because she was not incorporated <laughs> in the first original mural, which we'll get to. And I uh, warned her that that shade would turn into a very large portrait. So here she is on the day of my cousin Tawana's funeral. And you'll notice she's wearing a, a button, a pin uh, attached to her shirt with a portrait of Tawana. So the piece is a double portrait. It's called Yana and Tawana. And then of course you see the, the vines that are snaking through it, almost framing the portrait which is of course uh, a sort of classical device that's used to, to frame uh, portraiture. And uh, those vines are blossoming uh, Michigan bluebells. And uh, that's, that's what's happening here. <laughs> that's wonderful. Let's advance to the next image and talk a bit about that. And you, you mentioned classical framing devices. So, so you have a history of studying um, Renaissance painting and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that and the context of the works we're seeing yeah of course um so italian renaissance oil painting deals with creating light in the background glazing colors on top i'll do some of that technique here only with rice paper where sometimes the background you'll see painted and then rice paper is glazed it is glued over it so the color in the background still comes through that's that was sort of about the religious uh, projection of those uh, Italian Renaissance oil paintings, the, the sort of holy light embedded in them coming forward. Um, also, I think what's interesting here, this is a portrait of my cousin Tyler, which is after a portrait made by my hero Elizabeth Catlett, who did a, a famous iconic woodcut called Sharecropper. And in Sharecropper, there's a woman wearing a, a straw hat like this one that uh, I found my cousin Tyler with. So I I'm know paying that homage, well. I talk. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, you know that work well, right. So I, I talked before about uh, a paying homage to the Japanese uh, 17th tradition of woodblock printing, but here I'm also paying tribute to um, the tradition in America uh, with African-Americans creating woodblock prints. And, and printing them in large multiples to disseminate them uh, inexpensively and democratically to the people. So Elizabeth Catlett is my hero uh, in that regard as well. So this is a portrait of Tyla and you see of course some art deco elements that are intertwined. This is also a very large piece. This is, I mean, it's deceptive on the screen, but this is, uh, I actually think this one's about 10 by 10 feet. Um, there are wood wow. elements that are attached to the surface uh as well as uh muslin cloth where i'm creating mono prints onto muslin and then attaching the muslin to the uh to the canvas as well there's paint there's some spray paint uh there's a lot going on here but again woodblock printing as the primary method to describe form by printing wood grain um and then assembling that wood grain into uh, illusionistic dimensional space as if I'm building a statue of my cousin. And I can talk more about that process when we walk through the studio later. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's advance to the next image. And I do have another question um, for you. You mentioned, because this is a lot to talk about. So before we get into this, you mentioned Catlett. And there is also obviously a deep, rich history of woodblock printing in, uh, in America, but also in, in, in Black American art or African American art. Um, how, have you, how have you both paid homage to that history, but also separated yourself from that history? Oh, beautiful question. So, and this piece is a, this is a good place to talk uh, over this, this image as well. So, um, 
let me let me get to your question in a, in a little bit of a roundabout way as I as I introduce this piece. This is based on Diego Rivera's mural he made in 1933 of the Detroit Auto Plant, commissioned by the Ford family. This piece you're looking at also deceptive on your screen. This is 40 feet long by 15 feet tall. This is the anchor piece, the seed that I grew the rest of this body of work from. I replaced Diego's faceless white male workers with portraits of my family members, okay? And the reason I did that was because in some ways when I saw this mural, I was stricken by it. It was gorgeous. It was uh, committed to this sort. It was like a Sistine Chapel moment of seeing American industry, but black folks were left out of it. Diego was correct at the time, 1933, black folks were not allowed to work in the plant and there were no women allowed either. Okay. But that changed soon after. So I took it upon myself to sort of create a visual update um, of that history using the same compositional structure as Diego's mural. So you'll see a lot of the same factory equipment and machinery, even an automobile in the center, but there's not a lot of work going on. So Dexter, to get back to your question, Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, these are my heroes who are creating a lot of decidedly positivist image, imagery of black folks working at the time, because at that time, their agenda was to show the capability, the strength, the endurance of black folks in building America, okay? I'm at a point where I'm tired of working and I'm tired of seeing images of black folks always at work, okay? So what I'm doing is using some of the same structures here in this instance, the location is the auto plant. It's a location of work but I've used it as a family reunion. So a lot of people are cheesing for the camera. They're posing with their arms around each other, having a good time. So I'm intervening on the assumption of the black body as one that is designed for labor in this instance. I think that's fantastic. I mean, fa factory as, as family reunion. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it, it, you know it's like so it's like it's it's kind of meta in a way right um, because it's self-referential but also metaphorical um, but also uh, real um, it's it, it's a, it's so on so many levels so many levels let's take a moment and talk a little bit as we advance to the next image let's let's take a moment and talk a little bit more about labor and 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 what that what that means and, and what it doesn't mean you know um there are a handful of artists that I'm, I'm pretty close with that i've had a similar conversation with about black people's bodies as it relates to labor versus leisure and how yeah. in many ways for decades it was almost uh foreboding to show too much leisure because that was yeah. sort of an indication it was an indication of a lack of focus on progress but what that yes. did was it kind of created this weird box where you 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 started to play black bodies with labor in a way that was almost counterproductive. Um, what what was that aha moment for you? Was it was it the reconnection with your family's history as it relates to the auto industry, or was there something else that you were thinking about as it relates to labor and bodies, black bodies? You know, I had a conversation with my aunt Fatty, who is in the portrait uh, over my shoulder that I'm working on. And I mentioned the generosity of spirit, not a generosity of resources, but a generosity of spirit that my family has in creating these, these uh, holidays where there's so much cooking that happens in order to feed people, right? And to create, a, and to create the vibe. And I had a conversation with Fatty and I said, that's a lot of work. And she said, it's not work. I do it. I just do that. You know, we do that. And I said, Fatty, you are always working. You have done it so much. It is so much a part of your life. You don't even think of it that way. And then I began to think about the way that we qualify work in America under capitalism. See, labor is defined as an exchange of your time for my resources, right? And as that goes through the levels of class and ability, it could be your labor, your physical body for resources, okay? 
when we see the work that Aunt Fatty does in order to create, um, to feed 200 people for Thanksgiving, that's not considered labor in America and it's therefore doesn't have an, an exchange value. It's not, it's not commodifiable, right? And also it's not even acknowledged as part of the, the productive labor that we do. So th th those kind of things started to, to occur in my mind. It's like, what is labor? How do we value it? And how, how are we being undervalued in the labor of care, nurturing, and taking care of one another as Black folks in America and as a Black family, right? It takes a lot of labor and work and care uh, that, that is not translated into currency in our system. Fantastic, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have three portraits before we see an install image. And so in the interest of time, I'd like to go through this image and the following two portraits pretty briskly. And then we can stop at the install image because that gives us a sense of scale that we haven't had thus far. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about this work and then we'll advance to the next one. All right. So this is uh, my cousin Paige. Uh, Paige reached out to me first uh, through Facebook. Uh, so she has a special place in my heart. Paige has recently moved into my uh, my old apartment in, in Brooklyn. So I turned that over to her. She wanted to move from Detroit to New York. Uh, so I, I feel uh, very um, fortunate that I was able to provide space for Paige and also be a part of that family generosity. This is a portrait of her. You see the Art Deco architecture bursting around in the background and, of course, the wildflowers. Um, this also has some reference to a classical portrait, a girl with a pearl earring, um, right? So again, I'm sort of referring to many different histories, whether they're painting histories or woodblock print histories, but uh, inserting uh, the Black figure and specifically family members uh, inside of that conversation. I love what you, what you did with the hair in this work. It's fantastic. It's really fantastic. Uh, let's advance right. to the next image. Yeah, that's Uncle Scott. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, you know, same, same ideas here. You know, Uncle Scott is a wild boy, and I love to see him so calm in this picture. You will never see him like this in person, but it, it is beautiful to see him this way. And, um, you know, when I did this portrait, I found the family members celebrated this so much. Uh, he wasn't able to make it to the opening, but we FaceTimed him and uh, he, he loves the piece. Um, family loves the piece. And, I, and then I started to learn that uh, Uncle Scott has a green thumb and that he grows a garden and he loves flowers. These are things that I didn't know about uh, Scott. So uh, this, you know, creating this piece kind of brought out a lot of uh, a lot of more of the narrative for me. Wonderful, wonderful. If we'll advance to the next, this is quite different from what we've seen thus far. Okay, so we talked about Charles White. Charles White is known for making these figures with these massive hands. Again, those hands for Charles White were about capable strength uh, of Black folks as builders, as the architects of the country, right? So here you have that hand isolated, literally larger than life. And in fact, if that brick is a, is a reference for scale, that hand is way larger than than the work that is implied it should do, right? So the hand is sort of juggling the concept of labor as represented by those bricks and then this and taking this moment for respite uh, to enjoy these flowers that are uh, entangling themselves around the hand. And uh, you can great. also see some. You can see some of that Art Deco floral pattern, I think, very subtly in the background here. Uh, in person, you would see a bit more dimension and, and, and sort of bas relief because there's these wood elements uh, that are uh, there sort of popping out. So, yeah, making a reference to the flowers in the hand um, sort of mimicked by the Art Deco. So, again, to your point, Dexter, that's, there's that sort of like organic natural form and then the man-made form. So implying that Art Deco, even though it even though it, it emerged out of sort of industrial ambition, it still referenced nature at its core. I love the fact that it's a woman's hand. I've seen, I feel it's interesting because I feel like this is a sort of a, um, 
classical um, pose of posture of the hand, but I'm used to seeing that pose with a man's hand. Which, so, and and it, it dawns me looking at the fingernails or what have you, like how, um, how wonderful it is that this is also back to homage to family and, and the sort of familial um, and maternal lineage um, that you've been mining in your work. Um, so let's advance to the next image. And I wanna try to get through the slideshow pretty briskly from this point on, so we have an opportunity to do the studio uh, walkthrough. So this is the first image that gives us a sense of scale of, of the works that we've been seeing. And, uh, it, and so there's also a sculpture there. And so now we get to talk a little bit about the three-dimensional sculptural works um, that you've been creating alongside uh, the portraiture and, 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 and what have you. So let's skip to the next slide because I believe that is a sculpture and then we can talk a little bit about that process. So in the, uh, in the essay that I, I wrote for your exhibition in Luxembourg, uh, one of the um, passages from there is that, you know, on a conceptual level, your early woodblock prints are proposals or renderings for sculptures so that the illusionistic depth had to be believed from the start. And I wanna talk a little bit about how you arrived at actually making these 3D images uh, or these 3D, three-dimensional sculptures and what were some of the um, obstacles yeah. that you had to overcome yeah. to see these through? So I resisted going into 3D for quite a while because I didn't wanna translate one-to-one -one what I was doing in the 2D work into three dimensions. What I found is that um, a lot of African tribal uh, art, and specifically these masks, gave me an opportunity to abstract the form, right, so that I could still deal with the 3D, but I could resist direct interpretation of it uh, as a portrait. So here you have uh, a Keith Webe, a uh, tribal mask um, hybrid with a welding mask. In this image, if you look at the gray areas, the areas that are stained gray, those are the references to a welding mask that would be worn uh, in an auto plant setting when you're welding uh, metal to metal and the sparks are flying. So it's to protect the wearer, obviously the laborer. So these are two different parts of, of my uh, genealogy, of my DNA that I'm sort of hybridizing and merging together. Of course, these masks have two totally different functions. The uh, auto plant welding mask is meant for protection. In doing so, it hides identity, right? One has to uh, lose one's identity in order to be a part of the larger system of productivity through capitalism. The African tribal mask is meant to announce an identity and to perform one for community so that when you wear it, you dance it in a communal or secret society setting and it is communicated to everyone around you that you are possessed with this identity and it's among us. So they have in some ways very counter uh, functions, but I'm very interested in what happens when those two functions come together. The last uh, gesture, of course, is the torching that you see very evidently here as it's bursting out of the, the mask. And I'm replicating some of that uh, uh, torching that happens in the factory. This is also uh, just a way of sort of um, introducing a fire component, which is sort of like spirit in the sense because uh, African tribal mask is not complete until it's danced in ceremony and that spirit inhabits the mask. I don't know the ceremony and don't dance these, but I activate them through my own ceremony of torching them. So allowing the fire to inhabit them and have its way with them. Let's look at the next one. And that's brilliant, by the way. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, this is this is uh, similar. So this is a, uh, this is a Bois Burkina Faso uh, mask on top of another welding mask. Um, and you see there's areas where it's been uh, very severely torched. There's also this Art Deco um, sort of um, rusted fencing, a uh, ru rusted wire uh, element that's all over it as well. So again, referring to location. These are also mounted uh, on top of a uh, Art Deco wallpaper in the background that you see. It's a black on black, uh -huh. matte black, black wallpaper. 
Um, so again, announcing uh, this sort of location. But there is something about that wallpaper that I also find to be timeless. Uh, it's hard to to locate it as a as a, as a vintage or past time or is it a future time uh so yeah wonderful so i think the next image is our last and then we're going to do a, a a brief uh tour of your your studio great yeah this is uh another hybrid mask this is a, another bois burkina faso sundial mask there is some uh, Art Deco carving at the near the top center of that mask, and uh, again some very severe charring. Letting letting the charring the the fire kind of uh, you know make make these works what it must. I, I sort of want to remove my own creative impulses and allow the fire to 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 make to uh, to form these on its own. Thank you for sharing that. So we are now at the, uh, you know, the final 10 minutes of our discussion. It goes by so quickly. Um, I would love to give our uh, audience today an opportunity to see your workspace insofar as what you want to share. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about what it's like to be in your studio. Um, what goes down in the shop, as they say. <laughs> right. Um, it definitely is a shop. Uh... Let's see. So I'll give you a view here of the studio space. Uh, we have a work on the wall here in progress um, and some sketches and I'll, I'll get back to that wall. I think it'd be a good idea to mention that this is a block of wood that I've carved wood grain into and I have used this right. block for 15 years and what I do is I roll out ink onto the block. I print it and I brandish it. I brandish the paper once it's laid on. And then this is the resulting source material that comes from that. So this is, this is also very meta, right? Because this is wood block printing of wood, <laughs> of a false wood grain that I've <laughs> That I've carved into wood. And that wood grain then gets cut up and reassembled into the collage. So foundational drawing skills taught me that we interpret form through shadow, through light and dark, and through contour lines. So these contour, these lines of the wood grain allow the viewer to read form and follow um, follow that illusionistic space. So this is in progress here. Uh, a work like this begins with a photo of my aunt that I then Photoshop. You see that Art Deco uh, pattern popping into the background. And I'm drawing on top of that photo as if I was a sculptor trying to figure out how I would build this from blocks of wood. OK, that's my Aunt Liddy. Same thing. Right. So you see me printing out those images, drawing on top of them. We saw the uh, finished product of Uncle Scott. That's great. And, uh, I'm making I'm just making notes here about light and dark. Uh, the L is for light, the D is for dark, the M is for medium. I definitely give away all the secrets. You know that, Dexter. I don't play with that. I, I love to give away the secrets. Um, <laughs> and these are flowers that I print. So the great thing about printmaking is that once a block is carved, I can ink it up and print it in different colors on different types of paper. I can cut those and reassemble them in different ways. So I, cre I keep an archive of all of these flowers. In fact, in fact, let's go to the floor. That's where the real, that's where the real mess is. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. And so what I'm doing is looking at all of my options. I like to see everything that I can work with 
when I'm working on a piece. This piece here, this is in progress, and this is uh, this is a print on muslin cloth that is then attached to canvas. Okay, so again, Michigan wildflowers there. Uh, next to it here, we also have some. I'm working on these. Uh, some of these uh, African uh, figurines, fangs, fang, fang peoples. This is a monoprint. And a monoprint like this happens from inking up a, a plate, a glass plate, putting the muslin on top, and then rubbing that with a kitchen spoon, giving away the secrets is no problem over here. That turns into uh, the hair for an image like this. So this is uh, in progress as well, wow. obviously. Wow. Wow, it's, it's, it's great to see how that's built. Um, and thank you for your generosity. You know, a lot of people wouldn't want to share. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that you're, you're willing to share. No, we, we give away the secrets here. It's not a problem. Um, you know, the literal building blocks. So, you know, I talked a lot about these bricks as a symbol of, of labor, right? Because you know, when you see a brick and it's by itself that it's out of place, that it's meant to be stacked, it's meant to be used in order to build those buildings and that architecture uh, that, that surrounds us in the cities. So here is just a, a work table where I'm assembling these bricks. Now, one brick like this, uh, this might be made of three or four different sheets of paper. Uh, so I'm collaging and getting all my, my materials together. Now, I'll walk you to the very beginning stages of a work here where the work is pencil on canvas. That's my cousin, Ranisha. Um, and then I'm drawing out the different planes and surfaces and then collaging the wood grain onto the surface. So that's what's happening in the workshop. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So in our, in our final few minutes here, um, you know, I do have, I do have a, a handful of, um, you know, questions that I haven't asked you yet. And, and some of them have to do with the future. So you've had this, wonderful so you know I could, i'll just say wonderful although i've used that word a lot today i'll just use it again you've had this wonderful epiphany eye-opening experience of being co connected with family that you hadn't had a connection with or a known connection with for many many years and that's influenced your current body of work and it's had a profound impact on you i think as a person outside of being an artist just as a human being and so what, what are you looking forward to now? I mean, where, where do you think this is taking you? Because it seems like there's so many doors that are open now in terms of where you could go with your work. Um, are, there, are, there new, are there new ideas you're, you're sort of thinking about? And, and, and of course, you may or may not want to share them, but um, where, where's your head now in terms of your work? Like where, where, do, you, where do you see yourself going? Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's a there's a there's a, a whole new I, I think the best way to say it is that I feel like I've tapped into a whole new wealth of um, of information and experience. And um, there's just there, there's so much to explore. Uh, as I start thinking about, you know, the history of black folks and, and labor in the, in, the, in the states and then the sort of specific connections that my family have to a lot of these histories. And, uh, you know, then there's my own sort of personal estrangement from family and the kind of like uh, love fest that, that I think, you know, happens through this estrangement and now my family knows what I do. They came out to, uh, to, to the show at Sycamore Jenkins and they really get it now. Um, so 
they've they've always been invested and always been generous in uh, providing me with with photos and with information and family histories in order to generate my work. And I'm very grateful for that. In some ways, it feels like hitting the lottery um, because my family is so giving and so generous and and so excited to be a part of what's happening. Uh, You know, having said that, Dexter, I just did three solo shows in a year. This is my third at Sycamore Jenkins. So um, I'm actually resisting any creative urges at the moment. And all of my, uh, all all of my my uh, my energy now is kind of actually going into uh, figuring out how to rest, how to uh, how to have moments for self care, um, and how not to how not to work all the time uh, because uh, I think that it has been such a, a huge part of my life up to this point. Uh, raised by single parent mom uh, who was a public school teacher in an environment with, you know, a lot of blue collar uh, culture. Um, You know, I certainly prioritize and and maybe even moralize uh, work ethic. And I'm I'm sort of reconsidering my own connection uh, to those attitudes because as we know, that can lead to burnout, that can lead to being overworked. I don't feel that way. I feel very inspired and, and very excited about the next chapters. But I'm going to go on a vacation and I'm going to uh, take some time to see new things, to breathe deep and to uh, not not consider my own labor, actually, uh, for quite a while. And then I'll come back to the table, you know, with with the next chapter and we'll see what that is. You know, I love giving away the secrets. You know that I give away all the secrets as far as the techniques. I give away the secrets as far as materials, because there's artists, there's young artists out there who want to know how to make things. And I love giving away the secrets. Um, What I don't do is give away ideas that I haven't yet fully formed yet. And I think, you know, right now I'm very interested in Uh, letting ideas fully form and fully bake, not forcing anything, kicking back. And uh, again, you know, not, not, not working, not working is going to be the key. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, with that said, I'm going to let you uh, stop working right now (laughs) and uh, you know, and, and, and enjoy the rest of your evening though. I have a feeling that since you're in your studio, you're probably going to do a little bit of work. Um, So Yashua, thank you so much for your generosity, for welcoming us into your studio, welcoming us into your story and your life. Uh, I don't take these conversations for granted. I was fortunate to see you in person during my last visit to New York City, and hopefully we'll get together again the next time I'm in the city. And maybe we'll do a project together, which has been a long time coming. Um, So uh, on behalf of the Cat Center and myself, Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Um, I so appreciate you and, of course, the Gantt Center for being a platform for this conversation. But, you know, my brother, you're always welcome in the studio. And I cherish these these conversations as, as well. Can't wait to see what else we put together in the future. Fantastic. So my final words for this evening, um, the Gantt Center's goal is to always provide programs that inform and inspire. The support of viewers like you allows the Gantt Center to expand its reach and further develop programs like today's open air. To learn more about the ways you can support the Gantt Center, you can visit their website at gantcenter.org forward slash donate. Also, be sure to subscribe. You can click the button below your screen if you're on YouTube and you'll be updated on all future virtual programs. We want to thank you all for joining us for a great conversation, and we look forward to next month's open air with artist Jackie Malad. That will be on Tuesday, December 13th. Good night to everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.